Welcome everyone to the Halvern Department of Population and Family Health Seminar, Frontline Healthcare Providers During COVID-19. Um, to help kick us off, um, I'll turn it over to our chair, Professor Terry McGovern. Hi everybody, nice to see you. I'm really excited about uh, today's panel, which uh, because we're hearing from, I think some of the most brilliant and brilliant doctors around. And not only are they brilliant doctors, but they have enormous heart. Um, and I think it's been a really, really hard time. Um, so it's just, we're so appreciative that we get to spend some time with you all today. And thank you all for everything that you do. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, who's Rachel Moreski, Dr. Rachel Moreski. She's an associate professor of population and family health and emergency medicine. She's done many, many, many things, which you can all read about, but I'm not going to waste the time now. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, all, all of you. Thank you, Terry, for this opportunity. And um, yeah, this is a really special time um, in history, both from a clinical perspective and a public health one. And I think we're really lucky to have these public health clinicians um, talk to us today. So I'm gonna, um, again, briefly introduce everyone since you have their bios, they've done many things, please look them up. Um, their work is inspiring. I'm starting off with um, Dr. David Bell, who's professor of pediatrics and population family health here at CUIMC. He's also the medical director of the Young Men's Clinic at New York Presbyterian Hospital. We have Dr. Marina Catalozzi, who's also Associate Professor of Pediatrics in po and Population and Family Health at CUMINC. She is the Director of General Public Health Program here at Mailman uh, School of Public Health. We also have Dr. Craig Spencer, who is Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Population and Family Health at CUIMC. He is Director of Global Health and Emergency Medicine at New York Presbyterian uh, Hospital as well. We also have Melissa Stockwell, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Population Family Health, Chief, Chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Health Department of Pediatrics, CUIMC. I'd like to start off um, the discussion today to ask each of the panelists to spend about five minutes regarding both their clinical and their public health experiences so far, it's not over, during the COVID-19 pandemic. If I could ask um, professors Stockwell and Bell to speak from the, their administrative perspective as well as division chief of child adolescent health, as well as the medical director of the Young Men's Clinic. Also, Dr. Catalozzi, if you could also speak to the student volunteer corps um, that, you, um, you know, that you've been directing with um, Professor Grillo, uh, its abbreviation is CSSC. And then Dr. Spencer, you have extensive clinical and advocacy policy work that you've been doing through social media. Um, and I'd love for you to, to touch on both, if that's okay. I'll be quiet and we'll let each of you talk in that order for five minutes. Thank you. Do you wanna go first, David, or do you want me to go? Or? You want me to go? Okay. Oh, okay. We're swapping. <laughs> you, you have a bigger role, Melissa. Okay. 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 <laughs> See, this is what pediatricians are about. They're just about <laughs> like, the other person, empathy, warmth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, um, it's interesting to kind of think about it in retros retrospect, since it was a pretty much a whirlwind. So I took over um, as chief of the division uh, in the first week in March, and in fact, the the meeting where it sort of was announced as a division chief, um, we sort of announced that and then we were sort of just sort of talking about COVID and it was, we, there was just as the institutional travel ban had happened, but we really weren't seeing that many cases. Um, and, you know, it was sort of, you know, I think we were pretty naive at the time and, and kind of thinking what it, um, what it would all mean. And it was pr pretty shortly thereafter, I don't remember exactly at three o'clock on March 14th on Saturday where we got our, um, had our first uh, exposure potential patient who had come in, um, you know, earlier in the week in one of our outpatient clinics, and suddenly had to start to kind of figure out contact tracing and uh, and figure that all out. And pretty quickly thereafter, I you know I think I could say that our you know everything kind of turned upside down. Um, on one hand, we were incredibly fortunate in pediatrics, and I think a lot of us actually still, um, yeah 
feel guilty about that. Our, our adult colleagues really um, bore the brunt of this uh, and our emergency room colleagues in, in a way that, um, that we didn't. Um, and I, I think that was also a bit un unexpected. So, you know, in previous and pandemics, when so H1N1, it really was more pediatric um, focused uh, in terms of the number of share cases, mostly, you know, kids who were well, but just kind of the huge amounts of volume. And um, it was obviously very different this time. Um, I think in our many things happened in those kind of middle uh, weeks in March to the beginning of April um, in, in rapid succession. So uh, first we, um, started to at first kind of just dip our, our finger, our, our feet into telehealth, which is sort of funny now in retrospect, since so much of what we do is telehealth, but starting to get a few providers trained, trying to figure out how to use an Epic and started um, in, uh, in the call center, having some doctors who were there who could kind of quickly do telehealth visits with families who were calling in with concerns. Um, we then kind of got basically every pediatrician uh, trained in using telehealth and you know, I think we talk a lot about silver linings. One of the silver linings is really it um, kind of catapulted telehealth forward, I would say, you know, I don't know, maybe three years, many, many, many years. Um, we just weren't really sure how we were going to do that in primary care. And, you know, then by necessity, we sort of had to. We were uh, fortunate in that we had just moved over to new, a new electronic health record, Epic, which allowed us to use that the telehealth module. You know, it's not perfect by any means, but it allowed us to, to be able to, to do that. Um, uh, at the same time, we um, uh, started to close some sites down. So first, uh, just one of our pediatric sites uh, closed down. And then at that time, we had to open a new site, which was, uh, we called the COVID nursery clinic. So we had a lot of mom, uh, babies being born with moms who were COVID positive. And the way that usually about um, half our newborns who are born at the hospital come into the ambulatory care network system of the hospital. And we have a special newborn clinic uh, where they're seen the first couple of days of life and half go into the community. Um, but there were very few community doctors who actually would take care of uh, newborns of, of moms who were uh, COVID positive. And so there was a, a huge need for that. Um, plus we wanted to make sure that we were keeping, um, because the, the babies were also you know, on basically in, in, mostly in quarantine, um, separate from the babies of moms who weren't COVID positive. And so we um, really like within a week set up a new uh, clinic and uh, under, so Minna uh, Sasla set up and basically she came up with a pretty cool model, a uh, dual visit model, which now I think is actually being used kind of throughout the, the country national life because of us, but she kind of uh, came up with the idea of doing a uh, video visit at home with a mom so that she could kind of be part of that and have her questions answered. And then the next day um, the partner or someone else came in and brought the baby in. Um, and to speak to toward, uh, David a little bit, um, it was actually pretty in some ways, another silver line with, when the dads or partners would bring the baby in because they got to have this sort of moment that they probably wouldn't have had for a couple of months. Um, a lot of you know moms, was, I know I did too, like <laughs> micromanaging everything, but, but to have the partner bring the baby in um, and really be able to kind of be part of that first visit and we would take a picture and you know do a lot of training with them, I think actually, um, yeah, you know, had them be able to have the experience with their baby in a way they wouldn't necessarily have had before. So again, um, on one hand, very sad, obviously, because the mom wasn't there and couldn't be there on their hand um, that the, the partner got to be there in that way. So we set that up um, and then pretty soon all of the pediatric sites sh um, shut down except for one uh, because the ambulatory care network staff all got either were, had a huge number of patients, people who were out, but also got pulled um, to be covering other uh, places in the, uh, in the enterprise. Um, and so we all kind of came together in the Audubon Clinic and, you know, I think what was nice was that um, we, we are all a group practice, but haven't necessarily like been a group practice for a long time. And so I think us all being together in the same place and, um, you know, Marina was a bit of our cheerleader. So we had, <laughs> there was like lots of, um, you know, rah, rah in, um, in doing that. And I think brought our division very close together, I would say, um, you know, in a pretty special way because everyone was prox physically there together and seeing each other and um, uh, and then also just kind of, uh, just, uh, you know, kind of in the trenches together. Um, over the summer, you know, the sites began to reopen and we pulled back apart, but we actually kept our telehealth joint between the four sites. And so we still have this kind of central, and we've been really kept a centralized um, 
feeling around, around pediatric primary care. Uh, so we haven't lost that, um, which I think has also been a, you know, a silver lining um, of all of this. And um, I think the other thing was just administratively was just pulling people to cover. So we would pull people to cover into the Willoughby Nursery, um, pulling people and people came from everywhere. So uh, the faculty practice, the ACN, you know, David actually, David Bell is our, our um, stalwart, uh, you know, Willoughby Nursery Moonlighter, <laughs> one of our best. Um, uh, as the one of the uh, Allen Hospital shut down, and so that all the babies were being born at Choney, um, and so that obviously started to overwhelm our system there. So just a, a huge amount of coming together, um, and really, I think the um, I would say that the best of, of of people who just never stopped working, um, you know, every day that ne never there was never sort of a a, a pause, never a, a, you know should we be here or not. So I'm just incredibly um, fortunate to lead a division that really had, was just a um, amazing uh, I would say. Thank you for that. I'll let you go Dr. Bell. Um, this, uh, one thing that you brought up that I just wanted to highlight is that the pediatric emergency department folks which maybe um, Dr. Spencer will, will touch on they actually had to do adult care in the emergency department. I just and while well, your adolescents and adolescents are not <laughs> <laughs> what is the saying? Um, you know, children are not uh, small adults. Um, physiology is obviously more similar for, for a later stage adolescents, but just wanted to, to highlight that as well. Yeah. well. And, and also just to add, a, a, it's not no longer my division, but the hospitalists also took adult patients, started taking adult patients um, on the floor up to age 45. So, um, yeah. So that dovetails with the young men's clinic that goes up to 35 as a pediatrician. So I've, I, it works, but I didn't have to do it. Um, so uh, my story for the Young Men's Clinic, and I guess there are a number of things that even the people that are close to me may not know. Um, so you, every many people know that I got sick. Uh, actually, if, this, if that initial patient was March 14th, I actually uh, didn't come to work March 16th uh, because of my fever. But I realized that in hindsight that I was feeling sick the week before. Um, the context of that was that obviously early on we didn't have personal protective equipment. I had young men coming in from that had been traveling all over the world. One had been to Korea, one had been all over Europe for a music um, tour, uh, and then guys coming from Dominican Republic. And what was I'd say from a public health perspective and communication standpoint, we were, it was so early in the game, our communication between the emergency room and the patients wasn't clear because they were always used to sending patients to their primary care doc in two to three days. And so young men with, with uh, viral symptoms that we really didn't have an idea of whether it was a viral symptom or whether it was coronavirus were coming in and, we weren't doing, we didn't have any protection. It was there. So I was exposed the week before. Uh, the, the element that I was saying that no one probably knows is I, I sing in a group. Some of you know that. But I'm on the board of that group, and we're about 100 strong on stage. About 50 or 60% of our group is over 60. And we meet every Thursday night. Uh, that Monday prior to the week before I got sick, I was in the board meeting. We were talking about whether we needed to, whether we should continue singing or not. And we had already cut down, I think, to only 20, it, by the hospital standards, only 20 people in person uh, has a sort of cohort that we could meet, which I was at your sort of changeover, Melissa, and we were more than 20 people in that one room at that time. So that was, in hindsight, that was kind of scary for all of us to be there. But um, I ended up convincing my group to stop and not meet that next Thursday, three days later, four days later. And as we know from the Washington, uh, Seattle sort of uh, experience with singers, if we are really close together, singing has spittle and every and obviously aerosol and everything else. And I could have been uh, patient zero for my group, I think, at that time and infected a good deal of my glee club, which I'm really happy 
that we canceled and stopped. And I made a point, it's like, we couldn't wait. We shouldn't wait for anybody else to tell us to stop. We had to make the decision ourselves. So fast forward. Um, so I did get sick, had fever, was out for eight weeks. Can tell you my sort of story, but Melissa and Marina and Melanie were all incredibly supportive in various ways, but helped me out. I uh, was the sickest I've ever been. Uh, didn't recover for eight weeks because uh, I couldn't walk uh, more than a block uh, after seven weeks. Um, and I just actually regained my taste of onion and potentially garlic within the last month. So it's been a long, long haul. Um, fast forward that I did come back after the eight weeks and everything was still relatively in shutdown mode, but every things were at least moving a bit forward. And so um, obviously telehealth was in full swing. Um, there was a lot of a, sort of misalignment because things were shut down. We were, oh, you know, different things were going on. So after I kind of got settled and got a handle on things, it was around that time, maybe 10 weeks or 12 weeks later, um, that it was, the numbers had gone down. It was time for us to start seeing more inpatients. And so from a family planning program and young men's clinic program uh, and sort of working, thinking about teens uh, for uh, sexual health, it was important for us to sort of really think about what we could do. Both we were doing virtual, but many of them wanted to be seen for rashes or different things that were going on, weren't necessarily urgent, but they could have been. So it was really important to keep them out of their emergency room and see them as much as possible. So I've been a, a stalwart in trying to make sure our family planning program as a whole opened up so that, and the challenge was we have more providers, well, we have a single room for each provider. And so that becomes challenging to keep our patients safe. Obviously the hospital came through, made our waiting room safe and made sort of gave us provisions about how to distance patient and schedule patients. And we did all of that. Um, I can say that uh, from a sexual health standpoint for adolescents, it did not stop our young adults and uh, adolescents from having sex. <laughs> so um, there have been multiple infections, including a new HIV infection that, I've, that has come through in the last uh, couple of two months. Um, which, which the, just I'll wrap up by saying, what's an unintended consequence that I'm just understanding and I'm not sure how, how much everyone else has from the clinical spaces, the, our gonorrhea and chlamydia tests are on shortage around the country. And the rationale is because the same reagent that's in gonorrhea and chlamydia is used for the COVID test. And so everywhere else around the country is rationing the gonorrhea and chlamydia testing. For some reason, we aren't. I'm happy for that, but um, because I've picked up a lot of gunnery and chlamydia that are asymptomatic. So it's been good to sort of make sure I'm doing my public health good in that realm. But um, it's an interesting thing about how and how we think about moving forward with the rationalization of testing as we move forward around the country and what that will mean across the country for increased um, incidence and, and sort of prevalence of STIs in the country. Great, thank you for that. Um, and the reagent issue is been a big issue just in terms of um, supply chain for um, vaccines, which I think we'll touch on later. You also bring up the indirect effects um, part of, of responding to COVID, which we'll touch on later in the panel, but uh, I just wanted to, to highlight that. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Spencer, um, love to hear from you. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me and thanks for moderating this, Dr. Mareski. So I just want to start with a quick little story. Um, I remember it was the end of March, around March 28th, March 29th, and what Dr. Bell had already described, you know, kind of that early stage of the pandemic had already kicked in, things had shut down. I think the reality was starting to become clear. I was working in the emergency department at 168th and at the Allen, uh, in the northern part of Manhattan. And we were seeing what I think everyone knows by now, we kind of the really apocalyptic conditions inside the emergency departments. Um, I remember one day walking in and, and feeling quite honestly, like it was the end of times uh, in a sense, because 
spaces that I had known for almost a decade had completely changed, you know, spots where there used to be one bed, there were two when both people were intubated uh, on mechanical ventilation and many of those would end up dying before they were even moved from the emergency department. And I think everyone knows those stories. We've heard a lot about that. But I think the thing that we've overlooked in both medicine and in public health, and we need to continue to focus on is, is the role of, of mental health, not just for, for patients, because we know for everyone that was impacted, for family members of those who got sick, uh, who were hospitalized and those who died, the mental health toll was huge. But for frontline providers, including public health professionals all over this country, the mental health toll of this pandemic has been just monstrous and omnipresent and really under, I think, under discussed and appreciated since the beginning of this pandemic. You know, we've relegated this to a separate field, a separate discipline. We think about, um, you know, kind of psychiatry, we think about kind of mental health as, you know, uh, different aspects and different areas of study when in fact, they're all just one. I know the link between kind of physical symptoms and physical pain and, and psychological and mental health distress. Um, I wrote a piece in the New England Journal in 2015, outlining my experience taking care of Ebola patients in West Africa and how that kind of that, that, that feeling that, you know, was today the day that I got infected, I don't know, we won't find out for a week, maybe two, how that sticks with you and how that adds up every single day and how that can manifest itself as pretty profound mental health, um, yeah, just feeling unsettled. Um, and what I noticed really early on um, at the end of March, all throughout April, was that this is exactly what my colleagues in the emergency department, this is what colleagues really all over working in response to this pandemic were feeling. I would get phone calls on a daily basis from someone I worked with, you know, asking about the health of their kids and whether they're being selfish if they if they decide that they're going to quit um, and protect their family. People who were asking questions that many hadn't really been forced to ask when they signed up for this because they didn't think that this is what they were signing up for. And I just want to point out that, you know, right now, or at least throughout this pandemic, frontline providers and public health professionals have been at the breaking point. Um, we know that it has been hard until now. I think the next few weeks are gonna be the hardest part of, of really this whole outbreak across the US. Um, and there has been an assault um, largely by people who think that this is a hoax or this is you know a, a fake or, or who just really have undermined the value of science and in public health and what we do. And this assault on everything that we do has made it harder for all of us. So I just want to point out one, that there's been this huge, I think, mental health toll on, on frontline providers, but I think that that has been carried over to public health providers and really just the general public. And I think it's important we first kind of recognize that. Um, the other thing that I, I learned in those first few weeks um, during the pandemic, and I think is becoming more obvious now, and has a lot of importance for us as public health professionals is that you know, we really thought of ourselves as exceptional here in the US, here in New York. And in a sense, we are, right? If you look at the Global Health Security Index before this pandemic hit, we were number one in terms of our ability and our preparedness for a pandemic. You know, We ticked all the right boxes, we had done tabletop drills, but yet the US has responded so poorly compared to what was expected and compared to places where many of us work, where many of us go to, to help, um, that I think this dichotomy has become quite clear. There is an importance of learning from others. I've brought a lot of that learning from working in disease outbreaks in other places. Um, for example, working in West Africa, knowing how to set up unidirectional flow models inside of a hospital so that you go from lowest to highest likelihood uh, of infected patients so you're not infecting people inside um, having a PPE buddy, someone that is responsible throughout their shift to make sure that your personal protective equipment is intact, it's clean, it's keeping you safe. And these, I think, were all, in a sense, mind-blowing ideas to people that I worked with in the emergency department here because they had never had to do this, right? Even just putting on an N95 was not something that we needed to routinely do. And so I learned a lot from working internationally. I think we've all, as public health providers working at a school that, that prioritizes a global mission, have learned a lot from, 
from our global experience. And I think we need to continue to advocate for and really amplify the global voice and that global experience. Um, and then I think, I just wanna end on one last thing and just say, we all need to recognize just how amazing public health is. It's easy to look back in the last eight months and feel like we're still, you know, chugging through uh, daily records of hospitalizations and cases. And that's all true, but think of what we've learned. We've learned of the value of masks. We've learned that we don't necessarily need full scale lockdowns. We need precision public health where we do targeted measures in different places to get results that we want. And we learned that it's likely quite possible. It's important that we prioritize the right things in our society, such as keeping schools open, um, even if that means that we need to shut down bars and indoor restaurants and et cetera. Um, I'm happy to talk about some other things. I, I've taken my time, I believe, but I'll, uh, I'll touch on social media and some other things and, and some of the questions. Super, thank you, Craig. Um, so eloquently said, and I just wanna highlight a couple of things that you said that I think you called out very early in the pandemic. We were on some disaster preparedness calls in the emergency department. Both of us were brought in for our previous work in global health. And I do think one of the two things you, you said very early on is what happens when a colleague gets sick? What happens when a colleague dies? And it happened. And I don't wanna go into that because I might start crying, but I, 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 it was devastating. And, um, and um, you brought that out day one. You also brought the unidirectional flow model and the visualization of doning and doffing. And I just wanna say, that there's so many lessons that we can learn from this quote unquote global South um, in terms of, of preparedness. And I think we'll, we'll come to that during our discussions of the vaccine later and cold chain issues, because I think we often in previous, you know, tropical medicine, international health, that kind of very sort of post-colonial, colonial thinking of global North to global South lessons learned has flipped. And I think that this <coughs> pandemic has really uh, shown that um, very clearly. Um, Dr. Catalozzi, you have such deep experience. I wanna turn it over to you. I will give you a one minute warning. And then when I show you my phone, your time is up. <laughs> um, so I think just before I start, I would like everybody to just take a deep breath because um, I need one. I actually um, really am only speaking on this panel because uh, as there's only a few of us who are on this panel and a few others on the call who uh, do medicine and actively see still see patients and public health. And I think that's an important um, thing uh, to hear about. Um, and also because Terry literally checked in on me three times a day during the pandemic and I would do anything. Uh, she was extremely supportive. And, um, and Steph Grillo was uh, my constant uh, um, companion uh, virtually, of course. Um, there were five, um, uh, buckets of things that I want to talk about. Um, the first is um, that before the pandemic started, actually in December, January, we had started this uh, in my role as vice chair for education and pediatrics. We had started the power initiative, promoting overall well-being, engagement and resilience in peds. And we had no idea how important this was going to become um, during the pandemic. And it really, um, I would say my entire uh, career and life squished together because um, that became really important in the role that was most difficult for me, which was the role of redeployment. So I was in charge of uh, redeploying all of our trainees and faculty. Um, so residents, fellows and faculty, and unfortunately wasn't redeploying them within pediatrics. So sending them to like the CTICU and the ORICUs. And we didn't know enough about it at the time. We were working with um, folks who were doing all that hospital planning and learned a lot about um, how much time, uh, what it takes to be redeployed, what the learning curve was. Um, and gratefully, um, we'll, I'll talk about the CSSC, but we, I was able to, uh, the CSSC was able to put together an incredible redeployment guide for our physicians. But um, it wasn't just about where they were going, what shifts and how long, but also all of the mental health issues that Craig brought up. So we very quickly brought in COPE Columbia to try to help people to process um, what they were going through, to check in, to do support, to keep track of where people were. Um, and um, the person I was doing it with, we were joking, like we felt like we were like in the military, like going in to get people out and get other people in because once you had people there, it was really difficult to, to have the programs that we were referring to um, get them out. And we really quickly learned that keeping someone somewhere for four weeks was really not, not um, helpful. And that has um, helped us in our surge planning now. But I would say that was one of the most painful things because as I look at, um, every time I see David, I'm happy. I just, uh, and every time I see Craig, because 
I feel like he was doing so much front frontline work and sort of sending people out to do that is a really um, difficult thing, managing their program directors, managing like the layers of things that go into those choices. Um, so those two big things of redeployment and well-being um, uh, were really important pieces of what I was doing. And then as my role as vice chair, the education piece, which was really quickly being able to um, move everyone virtual, not just the medical students, but also the residents who like coming together and learning is a really important thing. So really quickly um, plugging into that agility. I was grateful to have uh, Stephanie to be teaching the MPH classes with me because she was like ahead of the game. And then I could kind of plug that into what we were doing. Um, and so being able to um, uh, uh, bring those two things together. Um, the CSSC was born literally like the day after students were pulled from um, the clinical work and essentially is um, was the attempt to recognize that students still had a lot to um, contribute in this uh, virtual environment. And it was true um, service learning and that it was the hospital that very quickly identified needs, um, individual um, providers and front staff, frontline staff, um, as well as um, students themselves and our community. And we have had incredible success. So on the oversight committee is Stephanie Ermi Desai from the medical school and um, bringing together public health and the medical school in this way was incredible. Um, having the time to do it and the support from our leadership and pop fam. Um, we've been, had over 30 um, projects, over 12 schools, over 2000 patients. And, you know, just some of the experiences of the re remote patient monitoring, we just didn't have enough space to keep people in the hospital. People were sent home who we would never dream of sending home and students being able to be involved in that, um, bringing uh, patients up to, to uh, be able to do telemedicine, um, calling the elderly um, who are alone, figuring out who's food insecure and getting them food. It was um, the first time that I really, um, I see Julie Chipman on here. I, I just, the way that NYP and worked with us and the way that like we just overcame barriers that I've never seen overcome before. And I've been working here since 2006 and it was like really pretty remarkable. Um, so for me, that was a, a big piece of like how to um, galvanize the, um, the power of uh, students, the power of student and faculty um, collaboration and the power of like integrating into systems and, and utilizing the, the student um, voice and um, uh, in, in, in their, uh, their, their really their contributions in putting into place a lot of the public health system. So, you know, being able to take over a work health, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a, a hotline for the community or the hotline shift for work health safety to give metrics back, that was really meaningful. And then I would say the thing that gave me solace was that I was still practicing. So um, we didn't have any our, of our fellows because they were all redeployed. So being able to do telehealth and in-person consults um, uh, really was a silver lining. These kids were having a hard time and they still are. And um, I was extraordinarily grateful for the opportunity to um, be with them in a different way and to continue providing care um, and reproductive health care, whatever it is, care for depression. Um, and I think for, for me, that was a, a really important piece. Um, and Melissa's um, really leadership uh, uh, provided that opportunity. Um, so I'm happy to talk about any of those things. Um, but as you can see, it all overlapped the education redeployment, uh, the well being, um, CSSC, um, all of those things really. I think brought together um, a lot of the pieces of what it means to work at a place that is so committed to both um, personal and public health. Thank you for that. And can I just say, I, I don't think I know anyone with more jobs than you. Um, you, how many jobs do you actually have? Because you have so many and then you took this on. So just, you're incredible. And it's um, what you've done has really inspired so many of us um, to kind of wear both hats, the clinical and the public health so deeply um, in each sector. Um, I'd like to kind of shift and I'm going to make this a little more open because I want to make sure the panelists have time to kind of talk about what they want to. So I don't want to make the questions too specific and want to leave time for um, faculty and students to ask questions. If students and faculty can start putting their questions in the chat in the next 15 minutes while you're listening, it might help us kind of um, think about it. So I just want to give you a heads up to start thinking about questions you want to ask so that we're not asking you at the last minute. With that being said, I just like to sort of highlight that throughout this pandemic, right, COVID is 
it, it, it's, it's, it's not getting better, right? It's deepening. We keep seeing mathematical models saying, you know, it's eight times as much as we think and, and right, it's coming out daily, both globally and locally. And it's exposed deep challenges in public trust, which we already knew if you have worked in the spaces that Dr. Stockwell has in terms of vaccine um, hesitancy, but it's also shown this, this real, I think, sort of questioning of the data-driven effectiveness of pandemic preparedness, containment, and sort of question the power and limits of scientific knowledge. And this isn't just in the US, right? And so those of you who work mainly, mainly domestically, please think of this from a domestic perspective, but Craig um, and others, please also think about how this uh, plays out globally. The confusion over the early CDC guidance on who should be wearing a mask, what type of mask, if masks were protecting us, are they protecting um, the population? Um, and, and then the incredible trajectory of silencing the CDC in early February from our government. The combination of the confusion and silencing was mind blowing and, and, and really devastating, I think, to public trust. Um, so we, in terms of effective public health communication, what can we tell like, what message do you want to give your, your students um, in public health? Um, we, we, we are successful at appreciating the problem, but as sort of action oriented people, how do we sort of what what public health actions should we be taking to have effective community prevention? And I'm going to give you each um, two minutes. I know that's not a lot of time, but I want to leave questions for students at the end. But if you can sort of think about the type of masks, um, you know, uh, what research says. Um, and if you're somebody who's working on the vaccine front, I can open it up. But thinking about kind of the equity issues in vaccine, we know there's 21 uh, million healthcare workers in the US. We know there's frontline workers that need vaccines after that, the elderly, the comorbid. And how do we deal with the grave racial disparities um, of, of delivering equitable services and how does that play into vaccine distribution? So I wanted to ask all my questions up front so I can just be quiet <laughs> and listen to you. So if you, you know, prefer to speak on vaccines, like I'm sure Melissa, that's your, your jam. Um, or if you want to talk about other public trust or mask that's issues, sure. I would be really appreciative. So can we go in the same order um, as before, just to kind of stay on, on track? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I'll I'll, uh, I'll choose vaccines. There's definitely lots to talk about there, but yeah, I mean, I think um, I think what's first of all, we're all just preparing, right? So I think we're waiting um, for the the EUA. So on de um, uh, December 10th will be when they review the one for Pfizer, and I think this morning I read that on the 17th will be the one for Moderna, and then um, I can say that the Department of Health has already actively engaged. Um, you know, the big healthcare organizations and just to figure out uh, being order vaccines, everyone is all hands on deck um, to figure out first how to get, um, you know, the frontline workers, healthcare workers vaccinated and then, you know, in our, and then our, our high risk patient populations. And so there's a lot of um, pretty amazing work. And I think, you know, just going back to what Marina was saying with everyone coming together, really, it's been amazing to see uh, everyone kind of from I'm more involved in the NYP side though, but all you know, walks of NYP coming together around this vaccine distribution to try and um, figure out how to do it and how to uh, how to do it right. Um, I think that I think from an equity point of view, I think there's there's sort of two big things. I think the first is access, right, to sort of make sure that um, everybody, uh, you know, again, it's going to be phased in based on high risk, um, but that everybody who's in the you know the high risk category. Um, has access to, to vaccine. Um, but then it's also about vaccine hesitancy. And we know there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy uh, in general, but particularly on the COVID vaccine, um, although that hopefully um, might, might be improving a, a little bit, but around half the people um, in, in the US have uh, said that they would get vaccinated. Um, and then in our black and brown populations around uh, maybe it's lower 30 for 40% for, for good reason, right? There's, there's a lot of um, uh, mistrust um, and, um, you know, from, as we've all talked before, you know, pretty horrendous history um, uh, uh, of, you know, racism in, in, in medical uh, and, and public health. Um, I think 
our real work is is in um, working with communities to understand what like, what are the questions um, and how best to answer them so that people can make an informed decision around vaccination because um, you know so all um, signs are this incredibly effective vaccine. I mean, I, we couldn't in the vaccine world, you know, getting that kind of effectiveness is pretty unheard of other than the measles vaccine. Um, and I see Craig shaking his head because, you know, you, he does a lot of this, you know, work internationally as well. And I, um, so one is very effective and so far it looks like to be a very safe vaccine. You know, obviously we're, um, you know, it's sort of more the more short-term effects there seem to be pretty mild, uh, fever, maybe headache. Um, and so, the biggest disservice will be that if people, if we don't figure out a way to gain the public health trust, um, people's trust of public health um, about the vaccine, if we end up with a vaccine that's very safe and effective and people won't um, won't take it because of, of, of their vaccine hesitancy concerns, um, it's just gonna compound the disparities that, that we know very much have uh, you know, affected um, you know, communities in terms of COVID. And so I think that is our work ahead is not you know, at the same time as, as protect against COVID itself is really um, figuring out how to uh, make sure we have equitable distribution of vaccine, but also, you know, equitable in distribution of education and really making sure that communities are getting the information that they need. Yeah, no, and really important point. And I, um, I won't belabor the sort of global south lessons for the global north, but I think cold chain issues and the logistics of cold chain um, actually are, are pretty, pretty well understood in, in, in many lower income countries. Um, and um, I think in some ways they're better prepared for the, the lo sort of the logis logistics and have logisticians that do that big lift. But one of the things I just wanna highlight, um, Dr. Stockwell is, is the sort of, um, sort of the cold chain needed for these vaccines is extreme cold, right? Um, and so it's it's not your typical fridge. And I don't know if you just wanna to touch on that. Yeah, so it depends on the vaccine, right? So for the Pfizer vaccine, which is the first, it's an ultra freeze um, for, for the long-term storage. You can actually have it in like general freezer for a shorter term and then even refrigerator for very short term. And um, uh, the Moderna vaccine is the usual freezer. And then the AstraZeneca vaccine is actually refrigerated. So it's gonna depend a bit on the vaccine. Um, I would say that that is part of the logistics because it's also at the moment, it looks like a multi-dose file. So it's, it's, you really, it's not the sort of one like, okay, come and you get vaccinated. It really has to be these sort of big vaccine, you know, huge vaccine enterprises where people are really ready to come in so that we can use the vaccine bill most efficiently, but also use the vaccine in a way that we don't waste a single um, dose. On their hand, we also have to keep everyone socially distant, right? So a vaccine campaign at the time when you actually, can't have everybody, you know, all pushed together, you know, is also going to be its own challenge, right? We're used to doing big vaccine campaigns where it's okay to be waiting in long lines, you know, with people. Um, um, together. Just in the interest of time, one, one, one last thing I just wanted to add to that. I can't remember where I heard the quote, but somebody said something like vaccines don't save people. Um, they don't protect people. Vaccine programs do. And I think we forget about all the other people and the logistics, right? That, that silver bullets are not usually technical, but it's the implementation of that silver bullet. Should I not go in order actually, just in case other people wanna, so we stay on topic. Craig, do you wanna come in on vaccines or do you wanna talk about masks? Um, I, I think that uh, we, I think everything, I just put in the, uh, in the notes here in the chat yeah. for anyone interested in um, a really short explainer on what's going on with vaccines, when you'll get them, the daily podcast today was absolutely incredible. I learned a lot. It was really, really good. It was worth a listen. Um, I think the vaccines and the mask, I think all this comes together under the one main point that I would like to bring. And I think that it is, we've seen this in pandemics. I think this is largely true in the rest of public health. The greatest threat that we have is not just bad politicians. It's, I think, disinformation. Um, it's there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is you you're misinformed, right? You're sharing something that isn't correct, but you don't know any better. Disinformation is actually deliberately spreading misinformation. This has been an infodemic of disinformation since day one. This is why you know people say that we are fear mongering and that this is all a hoax and this is all made up. Um, you, we all live in our own bubbles, in our social media bubbles, in our professional bubbles, in our public health bubbles. Um, I have tried to do since day one everything I can to get out of that. 
I have people in my family who are very different in terms of their political beliefs than myself. They think very differently about this pandemic than I do. I started an account on Parlay, which is a conservative, like the conservative like social media platform. So I understand the other side of this. Um, I think it is critical. And one of the things that we need to do the most is make sure that we understand the other side as much as possible, because that is who we're ultimately talking to. I think about what's happening now with people saying that this is a hoax, that it, you know, rumors about it, that it's all made up, that it's, it's all for profit. Everything that we're hearing is the exact same thing I heard in 2014 and 2015 in West Africa. And there's nothing unique about West Africans. There's nothing unique about people in Western Wyoming. This is just people who under situations of fear and things they don't understand react in a very, you know, a, a very, I think, very clear and very similar way. This goes back to um, vaccine, uh, I'm sorry, um, treatment campaigns against sleeping sickness in the early 1900s in West Africa as well. There is a linear progression of kind of similar campaigns and fights against misinformation and disinformation. I think one of the roles that we have as public health professionals that perhaps we don't focus on enough is our role in combating disinformation because I think it's the greatest threat to, to public health today. Thank you. Um, I know I want to hear from the other panelists as well. Um, I am realizing that we don't have much time left and I want to make sure we get questions from students if that's okay. Um, so um, Lizzie, do you want to help us field questions from the chat? I'll let you choose your favorite. Sure. Um, we did have a couple questions um, uh, pertaining to social media, um, including uh, one from Melissa. Um, how do you see the role of social media and public health evolving and in what ways can we use social media to inform, educate, and improve public health? Um, we had another um, question along social media from Julie as well, along the lines of using social media. How can we use our full complement of human resources and partnerships? For example, how can community health workers receive training on the vaccine and how to educate patients on it? How can we leverage CBOs and other groups that have an in and have gained trust of patients? open to the field. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say my part that sort of fills in with everyone else and also this. I think uh, one of the key pieces that I have, I'm sort of stealing and paraphrasing from Yuval uh, Noah your Harari. Um, he was on one sort of uh, television show and just really put the history of like the uh, 1918 pandemic in, in uh response to ours and in, in, in perspective to this one. And just said that at that time, individuals didn't know about viruses. We didn't have any knowledge about uh, genes in the way that we do now. We didn't have any of the technology uh, that we have now to be where we are now. And so if we look at this, these last less than 12 months, we discovered a new virus. We create knew the genome within a month we're able to understand some of the public, how it was spread in a, within three months and pretty much knew some of the public health ways to protect, although we didn't do it in the, quite the way some, some other countries did. Um, but the idea is we, we know a lot and we've done a lot. And we're, within 12 months, we already have three vaccines in place. And we put that in perspective, we are, it's a phenomenal time, despite sort of the craziness that we've actually had to experience. Yeah. And so the, the social media and the communication, he was on another sort of, um, Yuval was on another um, television show and he was talking about the role that we have to communicate and communicate better and more clearly to people that don't speak our language in the context of speak our medical ease, speak our, how we think about public health, how we talk about statistics, the lay person doesn't understand that. And so we really need, whether it's in social media, whether it's anywhere else, we really need to be out there in the forefront communicating the, the science information in a way that the people can accept. And the other sort of context I'll put out there really quickly is that the notion that some of the ways, reasons why we have disparate sort of context of understanding all of this are rooted, I think, in some of the 
cognitive biases that humans have, period. And how we sort of take information or you put it in one, in one space and another, and you don't really take into context what the science is for one reason or another. And it's, if we can sort of figure out how to put our communication and public health spin within understanding some of the cognitive biases people, sort of the human population has, I think we'll be better off. I'll leave okay. it at that. That's an incredible last point. And I, I just want to highlight it both from, I, I think we can even link the masks issues of, of, of the sort of challenges of communication, uh, learning the science, right? And sort of translating in vitro science to in vivo science, if people know what that means, sort of the lab to the lived reality of what that interaction is with the mask. We can't actually do prospective double blind, you know, randomized control studies with masks, it's just not feasible, but how to actually communicate effectively. Um, the same thing with vaccine efficacy versus effectiveness. It kind of goes also to that in vitro, like what is the, you know, sort of the phase three trials versus which we know a vaccine efficacy is very different and might be much lower. And I don't wanna get into the definitions now cause I wanna hear from the panelists, but I just wanted to kind of bring those two things together, but also from a societal perspective and mental health, we, can, we, we seem to have this gap of reconciling this sort of in vitro world and in vivo world into the lived experiences and emotional beings that we are in terms of fear, mistrust, and and um, yeah. yeah. And then it looks like Dr. Stockwell is gonna say something, so I'll let you come in. But I also wanted to say that there's a great question in the chat for Dr. Catalozzi. So after you respond, yeah. can I turn it over to the question um, um, directed by Amy at Dr. Catalozzi, if that's okay. Yeah, I was gonna say just super quickly. I think one thing is also, this kind of a short is that we have to live in the gray, right? That there aren't, we don't have all the answers um, because this is, you know, and we didn't have all the answers in March and we, we keep learning. And so it's not necessarily that, you know, a mistake was made or we didn't like a wrong decision was made. And sometimes like we're the CDC, for example, like we didn't know, right? So, but as we know, we have to be able to, going back to what David said, we have to go back and say, we have more information now. Um, you know, as we sort of go forward with that too. The other thing I think to know what people in public health can do is just know your facts. And so definitely around vaccination and everyone talks about it all happened so quickly. Like, yes, it happened very quickly, but that was a sort of the first part in terms of getting to these vaccine candidates where it was pretty amazing. And then from then on, like enrollment in a trial happened quickly, but the amount of time we follow people for like the rest of the vaccine safety um, surrounds and other trial information was done, like done well and done rigorously. And so I would, and I don't, I didn't get to listen to the podcast this morning. So hopefully they, they covered that um, in, in the podcast that Craig talked about, but I do think people are gonna turn to all of you in public health and ask you what you think. And so I would um, you know, kind of, I, I would say sort of know, kind of know the, know the facts um, as part of it, but going on to Marina's question. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to, to Dr. Catalozzi, but I just, just to highlight that last point, Melissa, I think, we failed in communicating also the evolution of how science will inform public health, right? We failed at being really transparent about the fact that if you, if you state things in the beginning before we have knowledge, that's just wrong and prepare the public for that ongoing kind of learning. Anyway, I, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Kettelosi. I, I just said that I copied the uh, question. So I think there's some really nuanced, excellent questions here that we should uh, respond to. And so I'd be happy to help us all to get those answers together and, and to send them out. Um, I think uh, the question of kind of what are the other effects? I think one of the things we had somebody come from Teachers College to talk to us about um, education and what this means for remote education. And again, um, I think we haven't talked enough about how uh, the disparities in BIPOC communities um, in terms of the outcomes and uh, the death rates, the morbidity, mortality, um, and we're going to see this in education as well. Um, and I think that that's what we really um, need to be thinking about and paying attention to. We need to think about and pay attention to, um, you know, the fact that a lot of folks in on uh, Wall Street and businesses are saying like, oh, things are still going pretty well. We're going to have a larger separation and disparity than we have ever seen before in terms of food insecurity and mental health. And so we have to figure out how can we provide mental health? There are not enough mental health providers. How do we do it in primary care? How do we do it by 
We've already figured out how to do it by telephone. How do we do it within, like, link it to the schools? We need to be thinking about, you know, as Dr. Gold is already doing in school-based health centers, but how do we get that um, really more um, universally seen? How do we get health education and sex education? I mean, I think some of the things that Dr. Bell is saying that we're seeing are frightening because kids are still growing and developing and are still going to engage in those um, activities. So I think it really, uh, it behooves us to take a step back and say, we are not going back to how it was before. And we need to think about all of our public health education and messaging in a very different way. And we need all of you to do that. Um, and so it's a call to action to all of you to get involved in any way that you can. If you want to get involved in CSSC, I have lots of good projects for you. And one of them we're thinking about is to think about um, we're working with May um, to think about, you know, how, how do we message better? Um, and if you guys have a moment, um, December 10th, I'll be happy to send this up. The IRB is actually having a session about Henrietta Lacks and um, I'm sure you all read the, many of you read the book and saw the movie, but really thinking about um, how, you know, like Dr. Spencer was saying, like putting on, on our, our bubbles of social media that the vaccine is safe is not enough. Like we really need to think outside the box and really um, uh, touch and communicate and work with community-based um, organizations, community health workers, which I think is something that um, Julia Chipman brought up um, to make sure that we are working together um, with the communities where we live and work and where these disparities are gonna be the most, um, uh, most harshly felt. So well said. Um, and I think, gosh, I mean, there's so many issues here, but Hopefully this gives the students some, some direction um, in terms of accessing um, actionable things that they can do. And we didn't have time to touch on it, but I think Dr. Spencer, and you just sort of highlighted it, um, noted thinking outside our bubbles, right? Like um, posting things to people who agree with us um, can be cathartic, but maybe not move the needle as much. And so thank you, um, Dr. Spencer, for, um, for engaging in, in in comprehensive spaces um, on that issue. Um, I just, any closing remarks by anybody? I just wanna make sure nobody feels like they had a burning thing to say and didn't have time to say it. So just final thoughts. We have we have two sure. minutes. So you each get 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I think I would just say, you know, I think we don't necessarily know what the next um, few weeks, months is gonna look like. But what I would say is, I think what got us through the spring was just an amazing coming together. And so, um, I think across the medical center, but I think among family and friends. So just, um, I think you heard in all of our stories. So just be, be ready for that again and make sure you're, you know, you're checking in with each other. Um, you know, it'll, it'll be different the second time because we know a little more about it and in some ways that will make it better. In some ways it will make it worse um, because, um, you know, we kind of knew what we lived through. So I would just say, uh, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, reach out to each other and um, you know, really re rely on each other, I would say. Great, Dr. Bell, 30 seconds. Hey, I can't beat what Melissa said. Uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, it's a new day. We have increased rates, but we do know more. And for most of us are responding, especially in New York, in a better way. Uh, so let's be happy for that. And let's hope for the 2021 to be different and better. And hopefully we can hear you singing over Zoom. <laughs> Actually, I do have a virtual concert. <laughs> yes, we're doing. <laughs> Dr. Spencer. Yeah, what I want to say, I think those are both really important messages. From working in West Africa, where for six or seven weeks, you didn't touch anyone, you didn't hug anyone, um, that became your new normal. So that when I came back to the US and I shook hands or I interacted kind of physically in any way with people, it was the weirdest most unsettling experience. And I think that even if we were all vaccinated today and we had herd immunity, we're gonna all go through this really weird process. Unlearning social distancing is gonna be harder than learning it. So make sure you have that support that Melissa was talking about. Make sure you have someone with whom you can be vulnerable because there is light at the end of the tunnel. We will get there. We need to climb Everest first as a country. Um, public health professionals are, are going to be the stewards to get us, get us through this. But make sure you focus on your personal health, your mental health, and have someone you can be vulnerable with in that process. Dr. Cataluzzi, final words. 
Uh, I would just say you are all our future and our hope. And um, there's so many people on this call who have continued to teach and to um, uh, uh, to train you. And I'm also grateful for them. Uh, I think if uh, someone wants to create a space where we can get together to discuss some of what you brought up and see kind of what are new things we can do, I think that um, is critical. And we, we need you. We need your uh, different perspective um, and we all need each other. And I can't say that more than enough, what Craig just said, like take care of yourself first. Um, you know, uh, what is it? Audre Lorde talks about um, uh, her uh, well-being and taking care of herself is an act of, um, I'm not remembering the quote, but Terry knows it well, um, uh, is an act of, um, uh, of resilience and also, thank you. <laughs> um, so I think that's critically important. And I hope that we can all work together to um, move forward and address some of the new issues that will come up. Wonderful. Thank you all for such thoughtful, um, you know, comments. Um, it was outstanding. Uh, we got various perspectives from each of your vantage points, your leadership, your clinical work, um, and we look forward to what you're going to be doing in the future. Um, I might do a shameless pop plug as a moderator for if you're interested in this topic and you're a student, we're teaching um, Dr. Coffee and I a outbreak preparedness and response course, spring two. Um, especially looking at the low resource um, settings. So outbreak preparedness and response in low resource settings, spring two. Sorry for the plug, but I just, if you are interested in this topic. Thank you all. And Dr. McGovern, do you wanna close us? Just, I, I mean, you are truly an inspiring group and uh, thank you so much for giving us this time and please take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you.